Please remain standing, all in spirit, for today's scripture lesson from the Gospel according to Luke. Listen for the word of God. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill hun- in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zachariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting. The child slept in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and exclaimed with a loud cry, "Blessed are you, a man, woman, and blessed is the fruit of your womb." And why has this happened to me that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy, and. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Then is it out. And please be seated. And thank you so much, Elizabeth, for that beautiful reading of the gospel lesson today. And good morning, Christ Church family and friends. What a joy it is to be together today, whether you're here in person or joining us online today. Again, you are welcome in the name and spirit of the Lord. Leanne mentioned it, but I will mention it also with a twist, and that's our Christmas Eve services, 3, 5, uh, 8, and 1045. As you're thinking about those services, also think about those around you who may not have a vital connection to Christ or a church. What a, what a wonderful opportunity this season, and those services in particular are uh, to uh, welcome people uh, to Christ Church United Methodist. Well, friends, let's join our hearts in prayer as we continue in worship today. Loving God, we thank you again that you've gathered us here today in the power of your Spirit. Lord, as we prepare to face the week that is before us, this last week of Advent, these last few days heading into Christmas, if anyone here is like me, they're contemplating all the things that they need to do between now and then. There's a house to get ready. There's groceries to be purchased, meals to be made. There's tasks to be completed. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come into this space and to take a deep breath and to experience your presence. We thank you for all that this hour has had for us up to this moment, and we thank you for the rest of this time together as well. We thank you that you are in our midst, O God. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. When you think about it, when you really think about it, life can be a real mess sometimes, you know? I remember that when my son was in the second grade, Jacob was in the second grade, and he had met a new friend in church, in our new church. We had just been there for a few weeks, and this new friend's name was, was Bobby, And Bobby was to become quite a fixture in our house for many years after that, but I never will forget what happened the first time Bobby came to our house. Uh, Bobby, it was decided, would be coming home with us from church after worship that day. And I have to tell you, it was one of those weeks where we were quite busy. Uh, I was getting settled in my new appointment and was quite busy. My wife was then traveling to Louisville for her job, which was about 90 miles away at the time. We had three children at home, and quite honestly, the house was not ready for guests that day. But Bobby was a child, so we weren't that worried about it. We didn't think he would be, you know, worried about the condition of our home. Well, I never will forget what happened when we got home. We opened the front door of the house, and we began to walk into the house, and Just as soon as Bobby got to the threshold and was coming into the family room, he stopped. And I saw his head lilt back just a little bit. And Bobby was looking around, taking it all in. And it was that day that we discovered that Bobby was actually a grumpy old man in a little boy's body. (laughs) Because he suddenly proclaimed, truthfully, by the way, he said, this place is a mess. Thank you, Bobby. Yes, yes, we need to pick up. We realize that. Have there been times in your life that if someone were to step inside of it, maybe just a little bit more 
than others get to, if they examine things just a little bit more closely, that they might join our friend Bobby and say something like, this place, your place, your life is a mess. I mean, let's look at Mary and Elizabeth in the gospel lesson this morning. There was something kind of messy about their situation, about their life at the time. Elizabeth, of course, was beyond childbearing years, and all of those years she and Zechariah had, had prayed for children, had longed for, for children. Those hopes had not been fulfilled. All the bitter tears that must have been shed, but now she's, she's fully into a, a possible only with God kind of pregnancy. And now she must have been wondering, well, how is she going to care for a baby at her age? Motherhood is exhausting for young moms, after all. How is, how is she going to possibly keep up? And what if something happens to her who would care for the baby? And, and we know, of course, that, that Mary was in a real mess. I mean, a miraculous pregnancy that might not be believed or understood by, by her family, by her community. And even Joseph, we are told, before he was to receive a message, in, uh, a message from the Lord that, that he would, would marry her, was, was ready to divorce her and put her away quietly. I mean, this is a mess. Was she going to face shame, ostracizement, punishment? Was that in her future? These women seem to be in a real mess as Mary paid this visit to Elizabeth, but, but everybody was in their, their day and age. The Jewish people, they'd been conquered, of course, by Rome, and the leaders were Roman puppets, and they had not heard a word from the Lord in, in many, many years as they longed for a promised Messiah. And then what about all of us, even today? What a mess. We don't have to look very far to see it, to hear about it. Russia is still in Ukraine. Tensions are high with China. Economists are worried about the next recession. And Kenny Payne and the Louisville Cardinals are 2-8 and eight going into Christmas week, and Kentucky still can't seem to beat anybody in basketball. But let's be honest. We don't have to look at the global or national stage to see a mess. We don't even need to look at a struggling ball team a few miles down the road. We can look into a mirror. We can look into our own homes, and we can see messes. Perhaps it's a mess of grief, sadness, and depression or messes of relationships with our children or grandchildren or parents or grandparents or spouses or friends that aren't all that we would hope they would be. Messes of failing health, messes of anxious living, messages of messes of financial stress, messes of, well, you name it. Let's be honest. Let's just be honest right here and now. There are two versions to our life, to the families that we have. There's the Walt Disney World version, and there's the Jerry Springer version. Yeah? Am I speaking to the right people today? Yeah? Okay. And they both can be true at the same time, by the way, both of those versions. Yeah, life could be a real mess. And that's one of the reasons the gospel lesson really gets my attention today, because the gospel lesson shows us something very special. I mean, if, if baby John the Baptist, six months in the womb... If that baby, if that baby is able, not, not, not even able to see, not even able to comprehend, having no real great cognitive ability at that point, not even be able to perfectly hear things that were going on around, can still leap for joy at the sound of Mary's greeting. It shows us something. It shows us that hope, that when love, that when joy, when peace comes near to us, we don't have to see it clearly. We don't have to completely understand it. We don't have to hear it intelligibly for it to move us and to change us and to utterly transform our lives. Perhaps even, perhaps, there's a message in the middle of the mess. There seems to be for Mary and Elizabeth, and I think there's a message in the mess for all of us. And, and one of those messages, or at least part of that message in the mess, is that God is doing a new thing. We certainly can see that with Elizabeth and Mary. Mary comes to see Elizabeth, and we are told that she is filled with the Holy Spirit, and she proclaims what Mary has not yet told her and what is not yet visible to the eye. Mary's expecting. 
Also, through the Spirit, she knows who Mary's child will be because she calls Mary the mother of my Lord. And her prophecy, it will soon be fulfilled when her own son prepares the way for the Lord. You remember that guy, John the Baptist. We hear about him most Advents. This guy screaming in the wilderness. People came out to hear him say things like, repent of your sins, you filthy animals. I mean, that's kind of the message that he had reminding the people that it wasn't their status as sons and daughters of Abraham that mattered as Christ was coming. They needed to turn away from those things that were keeping them from the Lord, their sin, and turn their hearts to the love that was coming into the world. God was doing a new thing, and He was doing it here in the midst of two women, Elizabeth, who was too old to have a baby, and Mary, who was not married enough to have a baby And not to take too much away from Saturday night's worship and sermon, but let me give you just a little bit of a spoiler alert here, that when God chose to come into the world, He didn't come in through the power structures of Rome. He didn't come through the religious elite of Jerusalem, and He didn't come from the wealthy and the powerful. We can see it happening right here, that God came to us from the humble, from the marginalized, the shamed, from a couple with a questionable, even scandalous lineage. Oh yeah, God was doing something new here a new thing, by overturning the fortunes of the weak and redefining what true blessedness and real blessedness really was. When God does a new thing, like come into the world in the person of Jesus the Christ, of fulfilling the prophecy that a Messiah would come and be here and change everything, it seems like God never does it quite like we expect. But that really shouldn't surprise us, should it? I mean, even our own plans, it seems like they never go quite as expected. Now, I don't know about, about you all, but when, when I make plans for something, it's like I'm right here at point A, and I'm thinking about point B, and I'll make a plan, and, and it's a relatively straight line from A to B. But you know what happens when I do that? It never works out that way. Does it work out that way for you? I, I bet it doesn't. You, you start going this direction, then you go up here, then you go back there a few steps, then you go underneath, and, you go, and it's like a zigzag until you finally get there. And there may be somewhere completely different that you expected when you started out. And it shouldn't surprise us so much because of our own lived experience that God is on some kind of a journey like that with God's people We've seen that throughout the history of salvation. It seems that God is an expert at getting us to where God wants us to be, where God needs us to be, where we need to be. We see this in the very beginning with disobedience in the Garden of Eden, with Moses' excuses at the burning bush, with resistance and grumbling in the wilderness. Why'd you bring us out here? We could have easily died in Egypt to unfaithfulness in the midst of covenant. Even if the mess is one of our own making, God is always doing a new thing. God is growing. God is showing. God is transforming. What's the new thing that God is doing in your life these days? What kind of mess are you experiencing? Know that God is in the middle of that with you, and there just might be a message Another message is that there is a blessed character to our lives. Mary is pronounced as blessed by Elizabeth. She's blessed in the sense of her status as the mother of the Lord for her trust in all that God would do and had done. In our English translations, they kind of hide how Elizabeth uses more than one word for bless. And in one word that, or one sense, that, that blessedness uh, comes from Uh, the sense that she would be well regarded then and in future generations, all the way up until now and beyond. In another sense, the Greek word used in the text is makaria, which is the same word that Jesus used when He talked about blessedness in the Beatitudes. She was blessed as she believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Blessed is she who believed. Blessed is she who was in the presence of the Lord. Mary was blessed in that, but she was also blessed in what is obviously a stark reversal here of God doing a new thing, something unexpected, that instead of being shamed or or somehow punished for, for having this child in this unusual way, she's instead honored and revered. Mary's blessed with divine joy 
because she believes in God's promises that God would do exactly what God promised to do. Of course, we're on the the other side of Jesus' birth, of His life, of His ministry, His death and resurrection, and, and we know that there is a blessed character to all of our lives because of what God has done and continues to do in Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, as God is indeed still with us in Him. The very name Emmanuel means God with us. But how are you blessed in these days? How do you realize, how do you recognize the blessedness of life? Is it through time with your your family in the coming days? Is it through a taking account of all the ways that you indeed are, are blessed in life? Is it maybe the growing sense, hopefully in worship, hopefully in other places as well, that we're blessed because we have a God who has not forgotten, who loves us, and even comes to us in the midst of our mess? I mean, when you think about it, theologically, this reverses our circumstances as well. We could be orphans, but instead, through Christ, we are made children of God. We could be considered convicted, but instead, we are pardoned. We could all be captivated, but we are still instead set free, lost, but found and saved. How are you blessed? Another message in the mess is this assurance of the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Mary and and Elizabeth, we know their circumstances. God's covenant people at the time, we we know the circumstances under which they were living. We know that John would, would call them to repentance and prepare the way for the coming of Christ. That God wasn't just being present and faithful for, for two women and their unborn sons. God wasn't just being faithful for one covenant people that God had been journeying with for, for quite some time. By coming to us, by coming to us in Jesus, in His life, His death, His resurrection, God was coming to set everyone free, everywhere, free from sin, free from brokenness, free for a life that is abundantly and eternally lived in Him. How has God been faithful to you? So let's go back to Bobby. A few years after that first time he'd been in our house, he was back to our house. I'm not sure if he ever left our house in those years. It was about three years after the first time, and he was back in our house, and we'd been having vacation Bible school that week, and and he came back with Jacob. I think he was spending the night that night, and and, uh, I wasn't back yet. I was helping to to, to tear down and reset up and, you know, kind of take care of everything with the, the rest of the crew at church. And, but, uh, but he had come back with, with Kathy and Jacob and the rest of the family, and, and that week had moved Bobby. He'd heard the message. <laughs> he'd heard the good, good news of Christ, and he was ready to, to talk to, to his best friend's dad, the preacher, about it. And he was ready to, to make a commitment to, to Christ. He wanted to talk about it, and and pray a prayer with me. And so he was quite anxious about it. I mean, he, he was wanting to talk to me immediately. And that's when Kathy let him know that, you know, hey, um, Bobby, you can talk to me about this. And, you know, you and I can pray. And that's when Bobby stared at Kathy with a blank face for about 10 seconds. He was really thinking about what she said. And this is his response. I think I better wait for Eric. <laughs> Uh, so we talked that night and we prayed that night and Bobby became a follower of Christ in a new way uh, that night and it was a, a precious time for him and his life and his family that we all remember to this very day and, and I think about that time in my life and in Bobby's life and that week and all that was going on in the life of our, our new church that was meeting in a school at the time in the middle of a mess God was working in that young man's life and his family's life and continues to be working in the middle of messes even as we sit here today. I was thinking about two very special groups of people that I spent time with on Tuesday evening, and the first was a group of people at, the, um, at our, um, um, our, our, our plant faith community, our uh, downtown, or I should say the West End at... Uh, Jefferson and, and 16th Street, and that's where 
the healing place, uh, folks were worshiping with us. Uh, most of the people were worshiping there from healing place. And I was asking them some of the same questions that I was asking, asking you today. I was asking them, what kind of new thing is God might be doing in your life? And I was asking them, how are you blessed? And how do you see God's faithfulness? And these are a group of folks who are working through the 12 steps, who in many cases have lost everything. They've lost relationships. They've lost family. They've lost jobs, sense of dignity. And in the midst of all of that loss, as they've come to the end of themselves and are becoming well in their recovery, we're able to clearly talk about how God was moving in their lives, how they are blessed, how God was and is faithful, the new things that God was doing. And then I came here for our final, our final Christmas concert. It was the fifth one that I had, had seen uh, in the last few weeks. And I got to tell you that it seems like every single one that I came to was better than the one I had been to before. What a blessing. Can we take just a, a moment and can we thank our music department and our choir and Dan and everyone? Thank you. There was nothing about there was nothing about the concert that seemed like a mess, but because I work here and because I know you and love you and talk with you and listen to you. I know you all have been working at this for so many weeks. And the thought that so many of you, 150, 160 singers and musicians, could come together over a period of months and come to a place where you can offer what you offered this community. I know there had to have been something of a mess somewhere in some of that as they're smiling and maybe even saying, Amen. And knowing that God was in that mess. Yeah, God is in the middle of our messes. And our messes can come in different forms and fashions. But there's a message in it. And the message today on this last Sunday of Advent is that God is with us and offers hope and offers joy and love and peace offers the very presence of Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Friends, for our invitation to Christian discipleship today, it's not so much of an invitation. Well, it is an invitation. It's an invitation to practice our discipleship in the world around us. As stressful as it can be for any of us sitting here, if you don't already have an awareness, I want you to have a growing awareness of the stress of the people who are working for us and serving us, whether it's the server at the, at the restaurant we go to after we leave here, or someone at the drive through or someone fixing our coffee, or someone helping us at an overcrowded store. I want to invite you to be extra gracious, to tip well, and if you're at a restaurant this week, I want you to invite that server. I want you to ask them as you prepare to say grace over your meal. Ask them how you can pray for them and be prepared to be blessed, if you will, by their response. Thank you.